Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of the actress Dominique Ellen Dunn. Dominique was born in Santa Monica, California on the 23rd of November 1959. Her parents, Ellen Beatrice Griffin Dunn and Dominic Dunn, already had two sons, Griffin and Alexander. They had also previously lost two daughters in infancy. Ellen and Dominic were wealthy and successful. He worked as a producer, actor and writer and Dominique had a happy childhood. Her parents divorced when she was 10 years old but remained close and both were actively involved in their children's upbringings. From a young age, Dominique was interested in acting and began performing when she was in her early teens. Her older brother Griffin already worked as an actor and producer. After graduating from high school, Dominique went to the University of Colorado to study acting. However, after just one year, she quit the university, instead deciding to return to California to get started on her career. Within three weeks of arriving in Hollywood, she had landed her first job in the 1979 television movie Diary of a Teenage Hitchhiker. Then, more roles soon followed, including small parts in the TV series Lou Grant, Fame, Breaking Away and Heart to Heart. Her big break came in 1981 when she was cast as Dana Freeling, the eldest daughter in the film Poltergeist. Her career was on the up and life was looking very good for Dominique. Driving around Los Angeles in a blue convertible Volkswagen Beetle, she soon became well known on the Hollywood social scene. In the autumn of 1981, Dominique visited the exclusive celebrity hotspot, Ma Maison. This restaurant on Melrose Avenue had been opened in 1973 by Patrick Terrell and had been backed by Gene Kelly. With the addition of Wolfgang Puck in 1975, it soon became a magnet for some of the biggest celebrities of the time. It was here she met the 25-year-old chef, John Sweeney. Their relationship was intense from the start, and within a matter of weeks the pair were living together in a one-bedroom house on Rangeley Avenue in West Hollywood. Unfortunately, their relationship deteriorated as quickly as it started. Dominique soon realised that John was extremely possessive, jealous and domineering and that he wanted to control all aspects of her life. He needed to know who she was with and what she was doing at all times. When Dominique's father visited from New York, he noticed that the balance was off between the couple and even commented to Dominique's mother that John seemed far more in love with Dominique than she was with him. Despite this, they had no reason to suspect that anything sinister was happening. However, John's controlling nature had now turned into physical abuse and it soon became apparent that he wasn't ashamed of who knew about it. Following an argument in August 1982, Dominique fled to her mother's home. John arrived shortly afterwards and started banging on the windows and yelling for Dominique to come out. Whilst clearly terrified by this, her family still had no idea of the extent of the violence she was suffering. Despite this treatment, Dominique returned to live with John and the abuse continued. Many of Dominique's friends were witness to either John's threats or abuse and in September 1982, the couple were overheard arguing by their friend Brian Cook. Brian was staying with them at the time. When Brian heard noises coming from the adjoining room, he went to investigate and found John physically abusing Dominique. Dominique told Brian that John was trying to kill her but John simply denied this and said that they should all just go back to bed. Dominique agreed but instead of returning to bed she climbed out through the bathroom window. 
When John heard the car engine start, he ran outside and jumped onto the bonnet of the car in an attempt to stop it. However, Dominique managed to escape and drove to a family friend's house where that friend took photographs of her injuries. Dominique then went to her mother's house where she called John and told them that their relationship was over. The following day, Dominique was filming a scene for Hill Street Blues during which she played an assault victim. Due to the level of cuts and bruises on her face, she did not require any makeup for the scene. The bruises seen in the episode had been inflicted by John the night before. When John moved out of their house in West Hollywood, Dominique changed the locks and moved back in. On the 30th of October 1982, Dominique was at her home with the actor David Packer. They were rehearsing lines for their parts in the upcoming television show, V, The Final Battle. At around 8.30pm that evening, John arrived at her home begging to talk to her. After a great deal of persuasion, she agreed to talk to him in the porch while her co-star David remained in the house. It wasn't long before David could hear arguing from outside, followed by a noise which sounded like someone being hit. Then he heard screams, and then a loud thud. David decided to call the police, and was inadvertently put through to the wrong police force, and was told that the house was outside of their jurisdiction. He then called a friend and warned them that if he died that night, it was John Sweeney who did it. Leaving through the back door, David made his way round to the front of the house where he saw Dominique lying in the bushes with John leaning over her. John calmly told David to call the police. This time the police arrived and when they did so, John admitted that he had attempted to kill Dominique. Dominique was rushed to Cedars Sinai Hospital and placed on life support. After four separate scans all showed no brain activity, Dominique's life support was turned off five days later on the 4th of November 1982. Her kidneys and heart were donated for transplant. She was just 22 years old. Dominique's funeral took place on the 6th of November 1982 at Good Shepherd Church, Santa Monica Boulevard. John was charged with first degree murder and also assault with intent to do great bodily harm for the earlier incident. The owner of Mamaison, Patrick Terrell, described John as a very dependable young man and publicly stated that he would assist John with his legal representation. Jury selection for the trial began in July 1983. John claimed that he was not guilty of the earlier assault, stating that he had simply been trying to prevent Dominique from leaving the house that evening. He also claimed that, on the night of the murder, he had been visiting Dominique after they had agreed to reconcile. He claimed that they were making plans to get back together, marry and have children. He then stated, that she had told him that she had changed her mind about being with him and when he heard this, he was filled with rage and had no memory of what happened next. The next thing he does remember was standing over Dominique and attempting to revive her. He then claims that he had attempted to take his own life, however there was no evidence to support this. The prosecution seemed to have their case hampered at every turn by Judge Burton S. Katz, who often seemed far more concerned with how he was perceived than presiding over a murder trial. When the prosecution brought in one of John's previous girlfriends, Lillian Pierce, she was there to testify about the violence which she had suffered at his hands. She was then not allowed to do so in front of the jury until the judge had reviewed her evidence. After doing so, Judge Katz decided that the prosecution could not use Lillian's testimony as the prejudicial effect outweighed the probative value. The jury were never made aware of what had happened to Lillian. 
In addition, the judge refused to let Dominique's friends of her mother testify about the fear and abuse which they had witnessed on the basis that their statements were hearsay. If Lillian Pierce, Dominique's mother and her friends' testimonies had been allowed, the prosecution would have been able to prove at least 13 cases of significant violence committed by John. Instead, the lack of this information allowed the defence to paint John as an ordinarily reasonable person who had an isolated incident of violence. When two photographs that had been taken after the first assault were shown in court, the defence team tried to undermine these by showing the third in the series of photographs. In this third photograph, Dominique was seen laughing, leading the defence to question the photograph's validity. It was explained to the court that this third photograph was taken when an ironic joke was made about Dominique no longer needing makeup for her scene as an abuse victim later that day, and in no way belittled her injuries. The police officer who was first at the scene on the night of the murder told the court that John had confessed at the scene of the crime and it was further established at Dominique's autopsy that she was brain dead before being taken to hospital. It was established that death by strangulation would have taken between four and six minutes which the prosecution argued was plenty of time for John to realise what he was doing. During the trial, the judge seemed to treat John with empathy, but Dominic's family with disdain. After a motion was put forward by John's legal team, the judge ruled that the charge of first degree murder had to be removed, as in his opinion there was insufficient evidence to support this highest charge due to there being no evidence of either premeditation or deliberation. The only options then open to the jury were second degree murder or manslaughter. After closing arguments, the jury deliberated for eight days and on the 23rd of September 1983, they returned their verdict. John was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter and misdemeanor assault. To clarify, the definition of voluntary manslaughter is that of intentionally killing a human being when the offender had no prior intent to kill when they acted in the heat of passion under circumstances that would cause a reasonable person to become emotionally or mentally disturbed. There was public outrage at the verdict and by the time of the sentencing hearing, the judge had changed his stance and criticised the jury for not returning a guilty of murder verdict. This was despite him being the one who had removed the first degree murder option. John was given the maximum sentence for his crimes, six and a half years. He was sent to a medium security prison in Susanville, California, where he served three years, seven months and 27 days in custody. He was paroled in September 1986. Soon after his release, John was hired as head chef at a high-end Los Angeles restaurant called The Chronicle. When Dominique's family found out about this, they protested outside the restaurant, handing out flyers saying, the food you will eat tonight was made by the hands that killed Dominique Dunn. John lost his job soon after. He then moved to Northwestern USA, changing his name to John Maurer. The Dunn family then found out that John had become engaged and contacted his new fiancé's family to warn them of his past. John went on to claim that the Dunn family were harassing him. Reports vary as to his whereabouts today and whether or not he is still alive. Dominique's mother started a support group called Justice for Victims of Homicide, which is still active today. For your information, I will put a link up for the website. Her work was honoured by President George Bush at the White House in 1989. Dominique's father, Dominic, passed away in 2009 from bladder cancer when he was 83. That concludes today's story. 
This story was suggested to me by Midji Yoon. There was also a few other comments made by certain people, so I'm just going to mention them. It was Betty James, A.S.M. Wood, Breezy and Sandra Sanders. So thanks for people commenting on that and suggesting this story. As usual, please leave your comments down below. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst, Donny Ettis has asked me to say the word slough. So Donny, slough. It's spelled S-L-O-U-G-H. Goodbye.